What I want to start with tonight, actually, is just to say a little bit about uh, the landscape of HCI work that happens at MIT, because there's a lot that's going on there, and many people who aren't actually on campus may not be aware of all of it. Um, most of it happens, uh, even though there's lots of people at MIT thinking about the future of computers and people, um, most of the work is actually happening in two labs, and they both have fantastic buildings. I work in this one. This is the Stata Center. Uh, which we moved into about five years ago, and I think we've just about found all the leaks in the roof by now. Um, and uh, it's a great place to work. And there's, there's people thinking about HCI problems in here, ranging from sketching to speech to language learning, perception and information and digital narratives and uh, controlling automation. Um, the other lab is uh, the Media Lab, which also has just moved into a fantastic new building which I think is far less leaky. Um, and again, people here working on speech and intelligent user interfaces and kids and tangibles and uh, uh, emotion and social computing and uh, common sense, um, do-it-yourself interfaces, human-robot interaction. There's tons and tons of great HCI work happening at MIT. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, and in fact, these are just you know, the faculty that are in charge. Uh, uh, if you count the students, there's probably over 100 graduate students and research staff that are involved in these projects, and countless undergrads that are doing research with them or taking HCI classes um, or hatching startups on campus. Uh, the, the final thing I want to point out is both of these pictures were taken at night, and all the lights are on. And that's not just because we waste energy. It's because there are actually people in those buildings working, right? And that's MIT. There's a lot of great stuff and hard work going on. Um, we're celebrating our 150th birthday, so these are some things that you um, may want to put in your calendars because uh, they'll be worth going to. Um, we're having a symposium next month about computation and how it's pretty much transformed everything that we do and, and lots and aspects of human experience from sciences to, um, um, to entertainment to travel to business all over the place. Uh, so there's two days of great speakers, including Tim Berners-Lee and Nicholas Negroponte, and um, really some of the leaders of uh, computer science over the last 50 years. And MIT is going to have an open house uh, where the labs will open up and let people uh, look around and try the demos. This is actually in, in combination with the Cambridge Science Festival, which is a nice weekend of activities for families and kids. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out and bring your, um, bring your families. So what am I going to talk about? <laughs> so the problems we've been thinking about lately have been problems that are very hard for computers to do and very hard for single users to do. So this is an example of a handwriting transcription problem that uh, is completely beyond the capability of artificial intelligence right now and is, in fact, beyond the ability of me by myself to figure out. Right? But a group of people working together in the right way can actually figure this out. And that's what I mean by crowd computing, how we can orchestrate small contributions from a whole group of people in order to get them to solve problems that individuals can't do alone and that software doesn't know how to do. We don't know how to do with software yet. So we're trying to take a mess of people like this and group them and organize them under the control of some software to solve a problem that we wouldn't otherwise be able to solve. Now, there's lots of places where we can get those groups of people. Crowds come in many different forms. Wikipedia is actually a great example of crowd computing in which the contributors are all volunteers. You can get a crowd from your social network, right? The friends that you have on Facebook are, in a sense, a crowd who could um, do something for you that you can't do by yourself. For prototyping, these kinds of systems, we hire our crowds. And we hire them on Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is this amazing website that people visit and do tiny tasks for tiny amounts of money. Um, and really, we're talking on the order of minutes uh, or seconds even and paying, paying barely cents. This is a scale of task that, uh, that, that goes up on Mechanical Turk. And the other nice feature of this um, system of Mechanical Turk is that we can, set, we can create these tasks programmatically. There's a, an API for Mechanical Turk that allows us to use it in the back end of a system and put tasks up on it automatically. <clears throat> I'm going to show you four systems that we've built that use crowds in interesting ways to add capabilities that we wouldn't be able to do with software alone 
uh, that, that a user alone would not be able to, to, to do. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the toolkit that we've built on top of Mechanical Turk that makes it much easier to prototype these kinds of systems. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about a couple of mobile systems we've built on top of that toolkit. And finally, a, um, a desktop application, actually putting a crowd inside Microsoft Word that can help you do your document editing. So first of all, Turkit. The big idea of Turkit is that we're trying to extend the um, instruction set that we have available to us so that it includes things that only humans can do. So in addition to having add instructions and jump instructions, we're going to have basically Turk instructions that put a task out of Mechanical Turk and get some response back. Question? Is Turk an acronym? No, uh, Turk, so Mechanical Turk, uh, it, the Mechanical Turk was um, this famous scam in the Victorian times that was a chess playing automaton oh. that actually had a human being hiding inside it, a very small grandmaster, master, whatever, hiding inside the cabinet. And that's what we've got here, right? We've got human beings hiding inside the cabinet of this, uh, of this machine. It's a wonderful joke that Amazon, um, wonderful pun that they played. So that's what we want to build. But here's the problem. <coughs> it's not enough. We can't really trust this, uh, this, this machine to do what we want. We, we're going to need algorithms that will be able to use this new Turk instruction sensibly. Here's a very simple task that I put up on Mechanical Turk a while ago that offered one cent if somebody would flip a coin and tell me whether it was heads or tails. Right? Very easy task to do. Uh, <coughs> here's what I got. 31 heads and 19 tails. Now, either that tells us that there's a lot of unfair coins out there in circulation, right? Or it tells us that these people were not actually taking coins out of their pockets and flipping them, right? And what we're seeing instead is a bias caused by the instructions that I gave them. In fact, when I... No, N is big, and so this is statistically significant. And when I've rerun it, I've, I've repeated it. So um, you're right. I should crank it up. And in fact, it would be very cheap to crank it up. This demonstrates another great feature of Mechanical Turk, which is that the cost of this is visually displayed by the number of pennies you see on the screen. Right? This cost me 50 cents to get 50 people to do something for me. So we live in a world in which crowds are actually becoming cheap and plentiful, and you can draw on them as a resource. So that's great. Unfortunately, crowds are unruly, right? People are unruly. And we need to figure out ways to get them to actually cooperate with the system that we're trying to build. So we need algorithms that are going to combine them in the right way. So let me come back to this example. Um, <laughs> We created this actually by hand. I mean, this is my, one of my graduate students writing with his non-dominant hand in as shaky a way as he possibly could. So he knows the ground truth for what we want here. Um, but one person is not going to be able to do a good transcription of this. This is, this is a lot of effort. The key idea that we have is that we can actually transcribe this by getting a bunch of people to look at it and contribute their alternative and diverse perspectives and iteratively improve it until we get the right answer as close as we can imagine getting. So here's how we're going to do it. <coughs> um, and now what I'm showing you here is sort of the steady state of this system. So we've transcribed part of it. And we've got some question marks in here where people didn't know what the answer was, but they've managed to figure out some of the words. And we're going to hire somebody from this crowd to improve this a little bit, to look at some of the placeholders and fill them in. So he's going to take his input and produce some output, which is an improvement. And then to make sure we're actually getting an improvement there, we're going to take his input and his output and feed them both to a pool of voters and ask them, which of these is a better transcription of what you see here? And we'll actually randomly order these two things so that they can't tell which one was you know, the input and which one was the output. And they'll actually have to look at them and make a fair um, comparison. And we're using yellow highlighting here just to uh, minimize the amount of comparison that they have to make to point out what's different. And we'll pay, pay each of those people a cent to do that so that, uh, um, so that we make sure that we're actually improving. And then the winner of that vote, the, the version that wins that vote will be passed on to another person who's going to make another iterative improvement. And then we'll have another round of voting, right? And each of these iterations, note, takes about eight cents and takes a few minutes to run on Mechanical Turk. Here's what happens with this particular 
um, example <coughs> over the several iterations of this process. Um, so we start out with um, the first person making some guesses, and then the second person tries to improve it a little, but they actually lose the vote because they didn't do a good job. Um, then we make some more progress and gradually fill in the missing pieces until finally after nine iterations, we get to a point where it's almost entirely done and there are a few errors, but, uh, but they've managed to change this, which was very intimidating one person into, um, uh, into a transcription. How about this one? So in order to make this a more repeatable experiment, we took printed text and applied a Gaussian blur to it to see whether this would be transcribable as well. Amazingly, people can do this too. So after eight iterations, we managed to get almost a, the, the complete transcription of it. Just this word is wrong. It should be uh, wedged, uh, I think. <laughs> um, but this is amazing because it shows the power of a crowd when they've been orchestrated in the right way and brought together to, to, to work together and to coordinate. So that was one algorithm that I just showed you. One workflow is another way of thinking about it for how you could have combined these people to, um, to do this kind of work. There are other ways that we could think about combining them. Question? Aren't, isn't everything you showed iterative, not parallel? It seems to be a sequential process. You don't have yes. the, that group of three people mm. talking to each other. Okay. Correct. Um, so, well, actually, that, that makes these three people technically a little parallel process in themselves, right? Um, because they only depend on this input, and they can each give their answers, and then their answers are combined, right? Okay. So, but the, the whole point is that in order to get down to this final product, you actually have to um, wait for the whole latency of this whole you know, graph here. Um, with parallel, what we mean by parallel here is that um, <laughs> the transcriptions, the initial transcriptions, will all be done in parallel. So we'll ask n people to generate transcriptions of the entire task, and then we'll vote on, then we'll do a voting process, basically a tournament in which we determine which one is the best, right? So that's an alternative way that we could have structured this crowd. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You're absolutely right that, uh, that having an expert, the question was, do we have a control condition in which we show that, uh, that one person can't do this? Well, another way of putting it is that how much would it cost and how hard would it be to find the person that would be able to do this all by themselves? And you're right, we haven't done that. We haven't done that with this particular experiment. But we have compared these two approaches of doing it on a crowd of small people with, uh, for small amounts of money, right? So um, paying uh, individuals um, to do the entire task and then voting on the results. And we did this particular process with, uh, um, with image descriptions. So if we have an image and we want a good description of what's in the image, let's say for accessibility to, to um, to attach this as, as metadata, accessibility metadata for a website, um, <coughs> then uh, we put this, this task through a parallel process in which these people were asked to generate good descriptions themselves, um, and through an iterative process where each person was asked merely to improve a description that somebody else had provided, and then we did voting between those iterative stages. For the same amount of effort, that is the same amount of money that was put into the, uh, put into the process, so the same amount of um, people writing and the same number of people that were voting, we got better results from the iterative case, that is the rating of the final paragraph that we got out was higher for the iterative case than it was for the parallel case. And you could also see if you look at the ratings of the individual products of the iterative case, you can see it gradually increasing here um, until, uh, until it sort of tops out. So our toolkit is uh, what's making it possible for do, to do these kinds of experiments very um, cheaply and quickly. It's uh, um, essentially a JavaScript library that allows you to write functions that um, 
that call human computation. And um, one of the tricks of this library, in fact, is to uh, make sure that, um, that these calls to human computation are, um, are uh, uh, as cheap as possible. So <laughs> one of the problems with using human beings in a programming system is that they're slow and that they're expensive. So, um, you know, a cent doesn't seem like it's expensive until you actually start to try to debug your program and you find yourself running it over and over again. And those cents are now adding up, right? Um, likewise, you know, a minute is incredibly fast compared to uh, hiring a, a user study subject and bringing them into the lab, which is a, a much slower process, right? But again, a minute is an enormous amount of time when you're talking about debugging a program. And if you have to wait a minute for a vote to come back or for an improvement to come back, then that's expensive. So what the Turkit Toolkit does is it records, it stores um, previous results from calls that you're making out to uh, Mechanical Turk so that you can rerun your program on those stored results very conveniently and very easily and without having to spend additional money while you're debugging other parts of the program. Um, the um, system is actually built as an online um, online website where you can uh, um, where you can go in and write these scripts that uh, that will use Mechanical Turk. So this is an example of the coin flipping task that I showed earlier, um, and uh, I encourage you to go check it out at this uh, at this URL and play around with it because it's very easy to get going and do uh, do little experiments that uh, that ask for human beings to do things for you. So that's our toolkit, and we built on top of it three applications that I want to tell you about. And the first two are about question answering. And the first one actually is driven by uh, the needs of blind people. So a blind person moving around the world who has to answer ha often has questions that require eyes to answer. This is a good example where you're in front of two doors, and which of these doors should I go into? Um, now, they often answer these questions by asking somebody who's nearby, a sighted person that's nearby. If that person isn't around, um, this system will help them deal with that problem by reaching out for eyes across the web. And here's how they do it. They, uh, they take a picture with their smartphone, speak the question into the phone, and then that question and the picture are sent up to Mechanical Turk where um, workers type in answers, and then these answers are sent back to the phone and spoken aloud to the, um, to the blind person. Now, one of the challenges here is to get this to happen as fast as possible. Mechanical Turk, even though there are people on it all the time, um, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a quick answer when you post a task. It may take a couple of minutes. So part of this system is actually um, doing some tricks that hire workers before you actually need them. So as soon as the uh, blind person starts this app on their phone, we go out to Mechanical Turk and hire somebody so that they're ready as soon as the question comes in. And while, the, um, while those people are waiting, they're basically answering old questions that other people have asked, which primes them for the task. It teaches them about what they're about to do and gets them ready and warmed up to answer the blind person's question as soon as it comes in, as soon as it arrives. <coughs> we did a little deployment of this with uh, giving iPhones to, uh, um, to blind users and found that we could get the latency of the question answering to under 30 seconds if we had sort of people constantly available, constantly online. Um, and that was a relatively cheap process on Mechanical Turk to keep, uh, to keep people around. Another thing we observed is that blind people have trouble taking photographs, right? <laughs> Probably a fairly obvious thing. Um, and some of the problems that they have are making sure that they're in focus, realizing whether they're dark or not, right? Whether they've gotten too close to the object that they're, um, um, that they're taking a picture of. In fact, having a flash on the phone solves some of these problems. It actually does deal with the darkness. Um, another thing is, have you taken the right picture of the right part of the object. Here the question is, what's in this can? Um, and unfortunately, they've taken a picture of the back of the can. Now the great thing about, so this would actually completely foil, um, this would probably be very bad for Google goggles, right? Um, but uh, 
Human beings are actually great at these kinds of problems. They're great at figuring out from this edge of this image here, this is the Goya logo. These things here look like chickpeas. Oh, and there's an ingredients list, and it looks like it says chickpeas as well. Human beings can make these kinds of inferences that um, software is nowhere near being able to make yet. And so it's, in, it's one of the beautiful things about building these systems with crowds of people behind them is that they just have an incredibly high ceiling for what they're capable of compared to what we can do right now with software. <coughs> now we've uh, done a follow-on to this, to this VizWiz system for blind people that looks at another kind of disabled user, which is one who's not physically disabled but situationally disabled. So when you're walking around the world with your mobile device, you are really disabled in a sense. You, uh, you have fat fingers, right? So you're sort of motor impaired with, compared to a, a user with a mouse. Um, you have a tiny screen with tiny text on it. So you really are visually impaired there as far as using you know, desktop size websites are concerned. Uh, <coughs> and most of all, you're intentionally impaired. Right? You're trying not to get hit by a bus when you're walking around on the street. You don't really have the tensional cycles to keep your head down on your mobile phone. Um, so those things motivated us to build an app that would allow mobile users to take advantage of the greater capabilities that a crowd over the web has. So you can speak a question, and Turk workers, a crowd hired on demand, will go out onto the web search for the answer to your question, and send that answer back to your phone, where now you can read it. So the, receiving the answer is actually a little bit easier than, uh, than it was in the case of blind people. Here's what it actually looks like running on a, an Android phone. Um, so the user speaks a question, and it enters it. Uh, the, the phone does the speech recognition, and they submit that. This is what a mechanical Turk worker sees. They see a question, and they see a frame where they can browse the web so that we can actually track everything that they do in this frame and capture it so that as they search for, let's say, fastest mile run in this case, um, and Google for that and find the answer, they then select that answer and paste it from there uh, into, the, uh, into the answer box. Uh, and this actually turned out to be a great decision because one thing that mechanical Turk workers love to do is copy and paste. Um, so this takes advantage of a sort of knee-jerk reaction that they already have that makes their work faster um, to give us the provenance of this answer. We now know that this answer came from this web page because we were tracking that copy and paste, and so we know exactly where it came from, and the user didn't have to provide that extra information. So you know about ChaCha, which is a Yes, this is similar to ChaCha, that's right. Before that, there was something called People Search, which a guy at Dartmouth started. And, uh, and also something called KGB. Yep. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a couple of systems in this vein. Um, one thing that's unique about Cinch is that it's hiring these workers on demand without previously training them, and, and most of the other services have previously trained them. Um, so we just, we're just sort of collecting them from the crowd without having to uh, um, pre-collect them. And we're also trying to focus what I'm showing you here is version one. We're working on version two right now, which is going to um, even more drastically reduce the amount of attention that the user has to put into understanding the answer and making the question. Because I think that's the key issue here in, in mobile interfaces is, is the attentional deficit that, uh, that users have. OK, the, the, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, this notion of, of crowd computing. Um, or rather, this notion of um, putting a crowd inside Microsoft Word. So, <coughs> and it, uh, it sort of gets back to a, a familiar prototyping technique that uh, now has a new spin on it. So the Wizard of Oz prototyping technique uh, traditionally was a person in the lab that uh, was sitting behind the curtain of your user interface, pretending to be the back end that you didn't know how to build yet. Um, well, with crowds on the web, we can now think about putting, those, putting that wizard inside the user interface sort of permanently. Um, we have crowd computation that's wired directly in as part of the back end of the system. 
Here's an example of what you might want to be able to do with this. So this is a problem that we have a lot in academia. We've got arbitrary paper limits, paper length limits, like we have to get a 10 page, uh, a paper down into 10 pages. And it's, you know, minutes before the deadline and we've played every trick that we have with, you know, reducing uh, line spacing and increasing margins and shrinking fonts and we're still a little bit over. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, we could try to do it ourselves and, and use this, the precious time we have left in cutting it ourselves. Um, we try to use an AI, but uh, there actually aren't any good natural processing techniques for this yet because there's actually very little data that they can learn from about how to cut, how to shorten. Um, and we'll come back to that question actually because that's, uh, that, that's an interesting future um, direction for crowd computing. We could ask our colleagues to help us with this, but frankly, they're all working on papers for the same deadline, so they're not going to help. Um, we're going to recruit a crowd instead. We're going to get a bunch of people, but not just a single person. We're not going to go find one proofreader. First of all, they won't be able to do the job in the minutes that we have. We really need parallelism. We really need a crowd. Um, and secondly, we don't want to depend on just one potentially flaky person that we don't know. So we're going to use this noisy crowd, but we're going to organize them in a way that uh, um, that individual flakes will not destroy our, uh, our system. And then once we collect, we're actually going to collect a whole ton of suggestions about how to shorten from this crowd and bring it back into an interactive user interface, right? So this is a more interesting user interface than the ones I was showing you previously, which were just query to the crowd, response comes back. Now we're getting a whole bunch of responses back into something that we can turn into a slider and drag that up and down so that software is now picking from all the things that the crowd did in order to give you a really good experience and let you drag your length of your paper exactly to where you want it. So what I, what I like about this example is that it shows really a symbiosis between a user you know, the end user sort of has the final editorial control over this and needs an interface that will um, be able to let them exercise that control. And software, so the, the software that is automatically choosing from all of these possibilities, right? That's doing what software does best, dealing with big data and, uh, and processing it very fast. And a crowd of people out on the web who are applying their knowledge of natural language and their common sense and their creativity and their diversity in order to do this very hard, really AI complete kind of task of identifying places that we could shorten a document. And they're all working together and doing what they do best in order to uh, make, this, make this process work. So we built this system that's a Microsoft Word add-in that has this feature in it. It allows you to um, send out part of your text and get it shortened for you. And I'll show you some results of some experiments we've done with that in a moment. Um, it also has a feature for proofreading. So you can send your document out and get people to proofread it and find spelling and grammar errors. And this is actually complementary and orthogonal to the spelling and grammar checker that's built into Microsoft Word. It finds different stuff. Um, but we bring it back and give you an interface that's very similar to the interface that you already see in Microsoft Word for spelling and grammar errors. You get a purple underline here, and you can click on that purple underline, and it will show you explanations that the crowd gave about why this was an error, and alternatives that the crowd suggested, replacements that you could just put in there instead that would fix the error. And a third feature, <coughs> um, so these two are actually algorithmic in nature, and I'll explain the algorithm that we use. Um, this one is much more open-ended and high ceiling, and it's a bit more like a, a sort of a Craigslist post for, uh, um, for document editing. Um, this will basically just post a mechanical Turk task um, asking people to do some editing for you. So you might ask them to change this text from past tense to present tense. Um, you might ask them to go look up the, the bibliographic citations that I just put in square brackets here. Um, and, and here I would point out that um, you know, the, the, the common sense and the, uh, the intelligence of the human beings that are actually executing these tasks means that you can screw up these instructions. Um, you know, a very simple thing you can do is you can misspell words in your instructions, right? And people will still figure out what you mean. So already it's different than programming, right? This is not a macro language. This is a human being instruction language. 
Um, but you can even mess up the, um, the data that you're giving them. So this particular example, you know, we used the, the, the wrong names of the authors. The authors were Mason and Watts, and we said Duncan and Watts. Um, and a combination of a smart human being interpreting that instruction and good tools, Google search out there on the web, um, allowed them to get it right. right? So this is a really a, uh, uh, an example of the high ceilings that uh, crowds can provide for your system. So the first two are algorithmic. I, sh I should point out that uh, one of the flaws of the human macro is that it does suffer from the noise of the crowd. So you're asking people individually to do these things. And even though Soylent is uh, typically breaking up your task into paragraphs and only having each person um, do this instruction for one paragraph, you still are relying on one person to do it well. And so you do see errors. Yeah, question. That, that was my question. So each individual gets a paragraph for the shortening task? Uh, not for the shortening task. Oh, Only for the human macro task. What I'm going to describe next is how we deal with noise for the shortening in the crowd proof task. Um, so and that's done by an algorithm. So I've shown you the iterative algorithm, parallel algorithm so far. This is a third one. Um, the idea of this algorithm is that <coughs> instead of giving up a, a, a whole paragraph to one person and say, proofread this, which is not reliable and tends to go off the rails, and, and people, there's actually two kinds of pathological behaviors we get from that. One is that, uh, um, one is we call it the, the lazy turker. People will do as little as possible. Um, often their web browser will show them a misspelling in that paragraph, and they'll go right to that misspelling and change that. So uh, even if we do that redundantly and ask five people to do the same paragraph, they'll all just change that misspelling because all of their web browsers showed it to them. Um, the other end of the spectrum, surprisingly, uh, is, a, is a behavior that we call eager beaver. And I think that these people are really desperate to show that they're not one of those lazy turkers. Um, because what they do is all kinds of changes to your paragraph that have nothing to do with what you've asked them to do, that, that are not spelling or grammar errors, or that are not simply shortening it, but you know, improving it in many, many ways. Um, an example of a kind of improvement that we see a lot is uh, taking a, let's say, a five-sentence paragraph and turning it into five one-sentence paragraphs. It's like we have newspaper copy editors all over Mechanical Turk who insist on having tiny paragraphs. So that isn't necessarily the intention right, of the end user. So here's what we're going to do that will control both the lazy turkers and the eager beavers. Um, we're going to break the task down into very small bits and have lots of eyeballs working on each of those small bits. The first step is simply to find possible places to work. So for shortening, this would be finding fatty bits of the paragraph. For proofreading, it would be finding possible errors and just marking them. And that's all that the worker has to do. So this forces a lazy turker to mark at least one thing. Right? There's always going to be something in a paragraph that you can say could be shortened or could be, uh, could be an error. So a lazy turker has to do at least one thing. <coughs> and then we keep only those patches, only those places that were found by at least two people so that we're getting redundancy and getting the, the, the workers to sort of check each other. And then we pass those identified patches onto a set of fixers who are told to propose replacements, propose fixes to the errors, propose shorter ways of saying that thing. And then finally, we have a verification step that's kind of like the voting step that we were using in uh, uh, in the iterative case, where the, they're presented with uh, a set of possible rewrites suggested by the fixed people, and they're asked to mark the ones that have um, errors in them. And they have to pick at least one, again. So we're requiring everybody to do at least something in each one of these steps so that we eliminate that lazy turker problem. <coughs> now, it's useful to, you could imagine trying to squish some of these together. Maybe it would be better to, um, put find and fix together, right? If somebody's identified an error, maybe they have a good idea of how to fix it. Uh, on the other hand, actually, those are separate processes. It's, it's possible, it's easy to circle errors in a, in a document. It takes more mental effort to actually rewrite it. So keeping them separate, actually, um, isn't necessarily a bad idea. But it also forces the workers to actually do some work. 
Uh, and it also allows us to merge work that, uh, that they're doing in parallel. So if we've got these separate patches in the paragraph and we're getting separate fixes for them, separate shortenings for them, for example, that's going to allow our slider at the end when we want to adjust the length of the paragraph to um, replace those patches independently. Whereas if we had people both finding and rewording whole parts of the paragraph on their own, then they wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to do those low-level selections. We need the verify step because we have, to, um, we have to keep that quality up. If we just accepted all of our fixes, then we would have erroneous ones. When you were envisioning this tool, what kinds of editing projects did you envision that you So uh, obviously, we eat a lot of our own dog food. I mean, uh, the kinds of editing projects that we do, we write a lot of conference papers. Um, and that actually is a high bar. Because the conference papers, I mean, we write technical conference papers, right? So uh, the, the audience, the, the crowd that we're using here is not computer scientists. Um, and you'll see that, that, um, that when I get to the experiment, the text that we're using is actually uh, some of it's pretty technical computer science um, stuff. And that, that has two effects. And uh, maybe I'll come back to that question. Did I, did I get at your question correctly? Yeah. Ah, and here's a slide that, <laughs> that, uh, that has some of the examples that we used. So <coughs> this, for example, is a blog. Um, uh, this is, these are uh, technical papers from uh, um, user interface conferences. Um, this is a, a clip from the Enron email. Um, one thing that uh, I want to note is uh, this is the... Um, this is the size of the shortened version after shortening, right? So it's, uh, it's going from 100% down to 78%, or it's saving 22% of the, uh, um, cutting 22% of the text. Um, this one cut 10% of the text, that one cut 18% of the text. On average, we're, we're getting about 15% cuts from, these process, from this process. Now, one thing we, you can actually do is take the shortened output and feed it back into the system again, and it will shorten it again. So people will find more places to cut because we're asking them to find more places to cut. Um, and we've been able to do this two or three times uh, in order to cut it down quite a bit um, without substantially losing um, signal. At some point, you will start to actually lose content if you do that. Um, one thing that we've seen in the technical papers is that People stay away from words they don't understand. We've asked them, uh, the instructions have told them, and the verification is trying to guarantee that it won't change the meaning of the, uh, of the text. So they avoid editing places they don't understand and instead edit some of the words that sort of surround them. Like, uh, in this paper, we argue that, for example, is something that they understand and, and consider fatty and throw it away. Um, was there a question? Down here is an example of one way that this approach fails. Um, so these are <coughs> two different parts of the sentence, it's saying the low order bits of the key and the next 15 low order bits. Those are, in a sense, parallel constructions. And then there are these parenthetical explanations of what those bits represent. And our um, automatic selection algorithm, our slider, um, does not realize that you should keep the, the, the parallel ones and throw away both of the parenthesized ones, right? So we, didn't, we weren't able to capture that, uh, um, that relationship from our algorithm. And, and as a result, the, the user interface will, will delete the wrong ones. Here's how much it costs and how long it takes. So it's uh, typically about $1.50 per paragraph to run this thing, which is actually comparable to what you would pay a professional proofreader to do it. But it turns it around much, much faster. So the, um, the time actually spent working, the time that, um, that workers on Mechanical Turk were actually working between when they accepted a task and, and, and got rid of it, um, was only two minutes. So if we had had uh, if our tasks had been picked up immediately, if they had not waited on Mechanical Turk at all, if we had, for example, used some of those, those techniques for VizWiz in order to have workers already ready, already warmed up, 
um, then you could get this work done in, in barely minutes. Uh, as it was, uh, normally a Mechanical Turk, when you put up tasks, they sit around for a little while before people pick them up. And uh, so there was some wait time that our tasks spent um, sitting in the system. And as a result of that wait time, it was typically about 20 minutes to get the whole thing done. But even that, it's probably an order of magnitude faster than uh, a human being could even read all of this text. A single human being could even read all of this text. So we wrote a paper about this thing. And you can't write a paper about a system about text editing without actually using that system as part of writing the paper, right? You have to eat your own dog food. Um, so we did that. So we, we, um, we passed our paper through CrowdProof and found an error. Surprisingly, we found a grammatical error, a rather subtle one, that where this word introduce should be introducing in order to be parallel with um, um, changing right here, right? Um, and Crowdproof found this error where the eight co-authors of the paper who had proofread it did not found, find this error. The six reviewers uh, of the paper in the conference that we submitted it to did not find this error. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, this was on like page eight of the paper. So any normal human being is pretty tired by the time they've gotten to this point. right? All of our crowd members were fresh because they only saw this paragraph. And this is all they saw. And they were charged with finding a grammatical error in this paragraph. That's why they were reading that paragraph. Um, whereas everybody else who was reading it cared about lots of other things, as well as grammar and spelling. Right? And their grammar and spelling were probably pretty low on the list of things that they cared about when they were reading the paper. So those fresh eyeballs and the fact that they're focused on, on that one um, task uh, uh, makes the crowd better than the user for this task. And here's an example of applying shorten to our conclusion. It didn't actually help in the final paper because we had to actually present all of the uh, uh, edits in the final paper. So it didn't shorten. It actually lengthened the final paper. But uh, um, nevertheless, it was uh, a, an, an interesting and acceptable shortening. And it cut it, again, um, to 85% length. So the algorithm that we're using seems to get 15% out of almost everything. All right, so what I want you to take away, what I hope you'll take away um, from this talk is that programming with crowds might give us the opportunity to actually build wizards into our system, to make them components of the software that we're building. And that means that Wizard of Oz prototyping actually might be useful and deployable, not just something that we use in the lab, but something that we push out into the field and let people start using. You, that has two advantages. First of all, we'll let us see how people will actually use these new systems in practice. So we can actually put the phone in the hands of the blind people and uh, find out how they take pictures, find out what they need to ask these visual questions about um, without waiting, right? And have them give them the ability to use the system um, and get good answers from the system right away. Secondly, we get to collect data, not just for designing the user interface, but also for training up an artificial intelligence. So now we've got questions from blind people about um, pictures of the world. And we can start to use that for better computer vision algorithms. We've got actual examples of um, shortening that human beings have done on a very small scale. You know, that is very tiny bits of text that they're shortening, very, very tiny changes that they're making. That um, that we can use to start training a natural language processing system. So the AI backend then becomes more of a cost savings, more of a performance optimization. It could speed up what the crowd is doing, reduce the latency of the crowd, um, save the money that we would be spending on Mechanical Turk by taking over maybe uh, some fraction of the easy questions that uh, the system would have to answer. Human computation also requires us to think in new ways about how we program, because uh, components, so to speak, that we're using, the, the, the participants in the process are unruly. And we have to deal with their behavior and try to get them to cooperate with each other and coordinate better than they would naturally. So there's a design space here in which we're not just talking anymore about um, users and AI or users and software. You know, this is the traditional 
user interface line here, right? How much do we want the burden to be on the user to do with the user interface? How much are we going to make completely automatic? Where is the point that we're going to choose in between here for the user interaction? Um, and so something like Microsoft Word sits on this line uh, where most of the effort is actually being done by the user. You know, they have to do most of the typing. They have to do most of the formatting. Um, it will do some things automatically, sometimes helpfully. You know, sometimes it'll create bullets for you when you don't want it to create bullets. Um, sometimes it will highlight things that are not correct answers, but uh, most of the effort is, is on the user's side. There's now this interesting space here, and there are other systems that explore this as well, where between a user and everybody else in the world, user and a crowd. So Google Auto Suggest is actually a great example of this, where um, it will complete your search query with what other people have typed in the past. And that's mining that from the uh, contributions of a big crowd out there on the web. And then there are systems like interactive machine learning, where the user and uh, a machine learning system are trying to cooperate in order to uh, um, in order to get something done. Now, these systems that I've talked about today, like VizWiz, for example, um, tries to push a lot of effort, a lot of work onto the crowd actively, so that uh, instead of just mining what people have done previously, you're actually asking them to do something for you right now on demand in real time. And Soylent is sitting somewhere in the middle. It's, a, it's an interesting hybrid of user interface Somebody dragging a slider and trying to figure out whether the substitutions are what they want. Um, a crowd providing the, the meat, the, the, the little bits that are used um, for that slider. And software, an, an AI that is actually selecting from all of those choices in order, to, uh, um, in order to fit the length that you want. So some interesting questions are how we can push these dots around, put more smarts into VizWiz so that uh, the crowd isn't doing as quite as many of the, let's say, easy problems. Um, put more training into Soylent so that uh, it can do some of the shortening for you automatically uh, without having to wait for the, um, the crowd to respond, but learning from what the crowd has already taught us. Uh, so that's, uh, I hope, giving you an overview of what uh, the kinds of things that my group is thinking about right now. I should uh, especially credit the, um, the students and collaborators who did this work. Greg Little is the lead developer on the uh, Turkit toolkit, and um, the experiments that I described are a part of his thesis. Jeff Bigham is a faculty member at University of Rochester who uh, uh, spent about six months in my lab developing VizWiz. And uh, Michael Bernstein is, uh, is a graduate student who's done a whole range of problems of uh, uh, systems in social computing and, uh, um, and crowd computing. And Soylent uh, is his baby. And I should also thank our sponsors and about 10,000 people out on the internet who, uh, who helped us with these experiments and, uh, um, and were paid for what they did. So thank you very much, and happy to take questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the interesting to see the phrase uh, Wizard of Oz uh, prototyping because when I first learned it, it pardon me, when I first learned it, it was Nambic prototyping. Nambic is P N I T T M B T C, which means pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh -huh. Good. So it was, it was nice to see that it's evolved. Yes. And the question is, do you rate people in the crowd according to how well or badly they do the input tasks that you've asked them to do? Ah, good. Um, we don't at the moment, but there, there are, there are big-time crowd employers who do. Uh, and that, that actually is important in order to make these systems cost-effective on a large scale. That you really do want to qualify your workers and uh, judge their quality. Um, First of all, just judge their motivation. Are they willing to actually follow instructions, do a good job, or are they spammers who are answering arbitrarily and hoping they'll get paid anyway? Because this market is unfortunately full of that kind of person. But also, are they actually capable of doing the task that you want them to do? I mean, 
given motivation for a text editing task isn't always enough. You know, there are some people who are better at text editing than others. Um, for prototyping, we actually find, for prototyping new systems like this, we find that it's good to actually embrace the noise of the crowd um, and accept the spammers as well as the, uh, as well as the good guys because it's, it's a bit like doing your, your software development on the same machines that, you're, that you're, you're, your users currently have, right? Even though you're developing for something that's a year or two away, um, and they'll have faster machines by then, um, you'll, you'll guarantee that your app will only run faster, right? Um, if it's good enough now on current hardware, it's, it's definitely going to be better on, on better hardware. So if we can build a prototype system that's good enough on a bad crowd, then we know that it's only going to be better if you can refine that crowd down to people that are, that are high quality. So that's why I actually like Mechanical Turk's noise. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess you have, we have to follow the microphone. I have the mic. <laughs> um, so part of what you're doing is collecting data so that better AI systems can be built, right? Yeah. Uh, OK, so my, my question is. Where, where that's possible, that's right. Yeah, yeah my, my question is, is what's your prediction in, in terms of how long until you have to change your research focus? I mean, when is, when is, when is, when is AI going to finally dispense with the value of the crowd? Yes. Uh, I mean, are you can, are you, so, so you believe? <laughs> no, I think that we're always going to be able to push the ceiling of what we're trying to do. And as soon as I think the, the, as soon as AI eclipses what human creativity and diversity is able to achieve, um, we may all be out of jobs, right? And there are, there are people who think that that day may come um, and the robots may rule us someday. But until then, you know, we, we'll be able to push, for example, to um, greater creativity. So instead of just um, looking for people to make tiny changes to existing bits of textual content, we may ask people to generate new text or to generate um, pictures for us or to use their programming skills or to use their visual design skills. I mean, the, the ceiling of a crowd you know, is sort of as high as you can imagine the ceiling of of human beings. Won't necessarily be possible to do all of the things on a crowd like Mechanical Turk, but um, this kind of idea, this approach is not limited to um, crowds of billions like that. We're also looking at systems that are sort of far more specialized crowds. For example, we're um, currently building right now a a system for crowdsourcing code review, crowdsourcing programming um, evaluation within the MIT student population, right? That's something we wouldn't try to put on Mechanical Turk because there just isn't enough expertise you, you on there. You probably but, have to uh, pay more than a penny, though. Yes. Well, not actually, when they're students, you can motivate them in different ways. Um, but yes, uh, when, when, you, um, when you start to uh, demand more from the crowd, you'll have to pay the crowd more. Just, just quickly, I, you're probably aware of the I saw recently on Flickr there was a case, I think Library of Congress put out a bunch of photographs that they couldn't identify that had come into their possession and people had, on Flickr identified the locations for them. Yeah, um, there's, uh, we get these kinds of things with, um, even with our little experiments. I mean, I showed the image description experiment that had a bird in it. We had another uh, case in that experiment where there was a, a statue, a monument, that we had found sort of randomly on the web. Um, we didn't even know where it was from, but we put it up on Mechanical Turk as part of this experiment. And one of the Turkers knew exactly what it was, that it was this particular statue in Tehran, right? That, uh, um, so these sorts of things can bubble out of crowds, and there's a surprising amount of expertise and knowledge that uh, is, is embedded in, um, in, in, in the crowd that you're drawing on that, uh, that can just you know, randomly appear. Um, what about the neurons in our brains? We have about a billion or on, in that order. Might there be crowdsourcing going on there? And there have got to be cognitive psychologists at MIT. So what do they say in this regard when they read the papers and, and attend the, the, the presentations? So that's a good question. Um, is there, are there processes in our brain that are sort of analogous to um, to these that I've been talking about here, where, 
more than analogous, more maybe identical. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I don't know that I want to speculate that, um, so neurons are much, much simpler. Neurons are much, much simpler, simpler than the uh, analogous, yeah. Um, Neurons are far simpler than the uh, than the um, than the human beings that are involved in these processes, right? Um, so, human beings are these rich, complex creatures that that are motivated by uh, and inspired by and think about uh, a lot of sort of rich, uh, nuanced um, uh, 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 things, and. I haven't even gotten into incentives, right, in this, in this talk at all. We've, we've only been talking about monetary incentives that, uh, that, that, uh, that refer to how we're paying people on Mechanical Turk. So, um, so I'm not sure that this will really be deeply inspired by the, um, the architecture of our brains or vice versa that this will particularly inform um, study of what goes on in our brains. I'm a little bit pessimistic about that, but it, it would be an interesting question to explore. Yep. Um. Thank you, Rob. Is there any research going on in evaluating trust of, say, arbitrary web content? It's, uh, it's probably a lot of people interested in that. I don't know whether your lab or anyone else is working on it. Uh, evaluating the yep. truth value of what you're reading. Uh, that's a good question. None of that work happens in my lab. Um, there are people in CSAIL that are, um, that are thinking about that problem. Um, so specifically Tim Berners-Lee and Hal Abelson's group. The Media Standards uh, Trust? The Media Standards Trust, I think that's... That, so there's probably a, a yeah. W3C working group, actually, that's thinking about something like that. That might be what you're referring to. Yeah. Um, there's also a group at Stanford, the Persuasive Technology Lab, I think it's called, um, Persuasive Computing Lab, that, uh, um, that's been thinking about that as well. So, and that's an interesting problem. Um, but we haven't directly done any work on it. Uh, was there someone in the middle of the room before? Got a question? So the uh, Middle East is ablaze because of social networking systems, and that's kind of a crude way of people to organize themselves. Do uh, you think this sort of technology could, in a future type of revolution or other large social movement, uh, accelerate that process? I could imagine, for instance, a group of people like them organizing a task of collecting ground intelligence becoming extremely powerful, much better than satellites, for instance, uh, when they're engaging in some sort of, uh, you know, like the struggle in Libya. Yes, you're exactly right. I mean, and the, the Middle East thing is, is actually interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that there are a lot of people who believe, analysts who believe, that it was triggered by um, much of the intelligence that came out of the WikiLeaks um, cables. Uh, which is, it's, it's with the WikiLeaks you know, State Department cables. Um, and another interesting feature of that is that, uh, that crowdsourcing is capable of producing uh, intelligence that governments are actually not capable of producing. So there's a um, very interesting website that I encourage you to check out called North Korea Uncovered, which is a map, a Google Maps mashup, um, I think it's Google Maps, of North Korea with uh, lots of landmarks, including military installations and anti-aircraft emplacements and all kinds of intelligence that was not created by satellite imagery or by spies, but by um, people around the web who had happened to visit North Korea and were able to contribute this information. Um, so. The, the eyes and ears and minds and memories of a crowd of people can be incredibly powerful for generating information. Um, another example that I would suggest here actually is, uh, is the Capital A Anonymous group, which is um, a sort of this amorphous collection of people that interact on a variety of different websites um, 
such as 4chan and, and Encyclopedia Dramatica, um, who um, some subset of them have been able to uh, engage in denial of service attacks against websites. They have um, stuffed online polls. So a couple of years ago, the, uh, the, the founder of the 4chan website, um, Moot Christopher Poole, was named Time Magazine's Man of the Year um, on their poll because uh, this crowd had managed to organize itself in order to make that happen. Um, so these crowds have power in the digital world. And one big question is, to what extent can they exert that power uh, in the real world as well, right? By creating demonstrations or um, by making things happen. They might not even take the form of demonstrations, but might instead be uh, equivalent of denial of service attacks in, in meat space, right? So, you know, we've been talking about crowds, or I've been sort of referring to crowds as if there's this sort of utility and, and crowd computing as some kind of analog to, to cloud computing, right? Human resources that are out there on the web that you can draw on. Um, when in fact that crowd is autonomous and it's thinking for itself and it's doing its own thing and it could be using its resources um, for its own purposes, whatever they are. Um, and not just for um, purposes of, uh, you know, what a government wants to do or what a corporation wants to do or what, uh, um, what a faculty member wants to do. So uh, along those lines, um, have you thought about how you would monitor the crowd? And I, getting back to the... Uh, what is it called? The VizWiz. So these were fairly safe situations right. for the blind person. Right. I'm always interested in edge cases. What if that blind person were in a dangerous situation? And now we have the crowd at a penny a pop. Oh, touch that lever. Walk this way. Right. Right. To what, extent, to what extent is the crowd going to be trustworthy right. in very risky situations? And, ha and have you thought about how you might monitor and, uh, these, these crowds? Yeah, so this is a Not great, an easy problem. Not an easy problem. I mean, one way, and, and it goes back to the noise of the crowd, frankly. Um, although it, it, it would be interesting to see whether people's behavior, how people's behavior would change if you posed the, the crowd with what was clearly a risky situation, right? Because it might actually go the other way. The spammers might wake up and say, maybe I shouldn't be goofing off now because this is a serious situation. On the other hand, the 15-year-old boys, right, the 4chan crowd, um, might be even more inclined to, uh, to goof off in those situations. Um, so some of it does depend on the character of the people that are inside your crowd. Um, and those are very important questions to ask. Um, I'd mentioned that for the VizWiz work, one direction that we're taking it now is uh, to allow the user to choose which crowd they're going to send this question to. Um, so you could have the anonymous stranger paid crowd, like Mechanical Turk, or you could have your social network, your Facebook crowd, and have this question posted on your Facebook page where you might get people that have your welfare, more likely to have your welfare in mind. Um, and it's actually, you, in some interviews with blind people that, um, that my collaborator Jeff Bigham has done, um, there's indications that um, the user wants uh, the option of both. That there are questions that you would rather not ask your social network that are, in a sense, too personal to ask your social network. You know, Does this look like a bad rash on my leg? Is maybe a question you're not posting to your Facebook page, right? Um, so, uh, so giving that option to the, to the user um, might be one way that we can, we can address that. Can you repeat the North Korea site? North Korea Uncovered. If you Google for that, you'll find it. So I'm an old fuddy-duddy, and I actually saw the movie Soylent Green years and years uh, ago. So looking at that has been disturbing me the whole uh, time, if one remembers what Soylent Green was made yes. of. I mean, it's I understand the joke. It's a bad joke. Um, but that made me think about the question of culturally divergent responses to 
queries and this sort of thing. For example, Good. one right. thing you might want to look at um, in your various editing things, people might want to ask, is this language racist, mm -hmm. for example? And I could see that's a question where a certain number of your 14-year-old nice privileged people with fast web connections yet are willing to work for $4 an hour might have one answer, a subset might have a different answer, right. and somehow you have to decide which of those is right in that situation. It might be that the, minor, the, the smaller people might have the better answer, but the larger number of the crowd might have a different answer. I've heard this sort of charge about many Wikipedia articles where an overwhelming majority of the material is written by men, and not including, in some cases, right. a perhaps more gender neutral point of view. So how do you deal with those sorts I mean, is it possible to deal with the sorts of questions? Again, where you have more than one group which has divergent answers to a question here. That's a great question. So um, what you're sort of getting at is what is the character of the crowd and what uh, um, are there ways that we could perhaps stratify it so that you can get your questions or your work or the effort put in by a crowd that more closely matches what you hope to get out of it, right? Um, one of the interesting features of Mechanical Turk, in fact, is that right now it's two different crowds. There is an American crowd that you get at certain hours of the day, and there is an Indian crowd that you get at other hours of the day. Um, and those, uh, and, and we have actually posted tasks. Um, we did an inter interesting task in which we wanted people to break down the steps of getting married, right? Um, so this is like, you know, imagine you're going to write an eHow article about how to get married. Um, and depending on what time of day you post that on Mechanical Turk, um, sometimes your answers all come back, you know, where the first step is get permission from your parents. And sometimes that's nowhere in the steps at all, right? Um, so there's enormous, you know, cultural effects, and, and the culture of the crowd really affects the way that it's going to do the work for you and the kinds of answers that you're going to get. Um, I don't think that there are a whole lot of 15-year-olds on Mechanical Turk. Um, I think that there are, um, it, it, people have done some interesting demographics, actually, of the spammers, of the, the people who misbehave on Mechanical Turk, and they appear to be mostly bankers. Um, <laughs> yeah, at least that's what they say they are. So. Um, um, but different kinds of crowds, you know, the web as a whole does suffer from the 15-year-old boy problem, and that certainly is a problem for Wikipedia. So that's a great, great comment. Uh, Nicole. Why are they there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who, who are they? And I mean, you're working for like 40, 60 cents an hour? Who spends their time doing that? Yeah, very good question. So, and again, the answer depends on whether we're talking about the American crowd or the Indian crowd. Um, the American crowd, which is the first crowd on Mechanical Turk, the, initially the site was only open to people who had U.S. bank accounts, basically. Um, the American crowd seems to be there because they're underemployed or bored. Um, this is what they do while watching TV. This is what they do in place of watching solitaire. So it allows you to feel like you're actually doing something productive, and you know the you know 80 cents that you get back in exchange for your minutes of productivity let you feel like you've you've actually accomplished something and done some good in the world. Um, the Indian crowd, that money actually goes a lot farther. So for for many of the people on Mechanical Turk in India, they report that it's a significant secondary form of income for them. Um, some of them, a tiny fraction, even say that it's their primary source of income, something like 8 or 10 percent of uh, the Indian population says that they, they are mechanical Turkers full time. Um, yes? Um, no, uh, aren't there people who do this because they love to answer questions? Aren't there people who love to answer questions? Uh, uh, yeah, th well, there are probably people who do it because they love some of the particular kinds of work that's on Mechanical Turk. Um, uh, and most of what's on Mechanical Turk is, are things like image labeling and transcription. So th these little systems that we're building here, we are like a drop in the flood of stuff that's on Mechanical Turk. Um, so in fact, I think that one reason that our systems succeed uh, is that um, we're like a novelty compared to most of the stuff that people are doing. So. Um, 
you know, a chance to answer some visual questions is like a new kind of solitaire game that is now cropping up um, that I can play for a few minutes and then it will go away because the experiment is over. Um, but that makes it a nice prototyping platform, right? Because it means that you've got people that are in there and are going to be motivated by that kind of novelty. So I think we'll have to wrap up at this point, but thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the invitation.